This is our last chapter of Joseph. I think God has been gracious to us through the study of Joseph this semester. Here at the end, we see two deaths. We see, obviously, the death of Jacob, and we see the death of Joseph. How should we face death properly? How should we face death properly? As much as people would like to avoid the reality of death, death is unavoidable. God promised Adam and Eve if they ate of the forbidden tree that they would surely die. And obviously one of the, one of the hardest chapters to read in the Bible is simply the genealogies. The genealogies simply say so-and-so lived and then they died. So-and-so lived and then they died. Part of what that's doing is simply recounting God's promise that if they ate of this tree, that all mankind would be affected by it. And so all of us are affected by death both directly because we'll all die at some point or indirectly as people die around us. Um, Hebrews 9.27 says people are appointed to die once and then to face judgment. It's a reality that we'll all face even though we try to avoid it. Ecclesiastes 7.2 says this, It is better to go to a funeral than a feast. For death is the destiny of every person and the living should take this to heart. Um, Solomon, the wisest man in the world, said the living should take this to heart, that everyone is going to die, that we should think about this. Thinking about the reality of death is healthy for us in this sense, both to prepare for it and also to help us live better lives. We get to do this as we look at Genesis 49 and 50, and we see these two deaths. Hebrews 11, 21 through 22, says this about Jacob and Joseph's death. By faith. Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped as he leaned on his staff. Staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave instructions about his burial. Hebrews 11, the, right, the, the, the heroes of the faith chapter, essentially says that these people died and demonstrated faith. And so as we look at this chapter, we learn something about how to face death, death well. How to face death properly. Um, because we're believers, we should be more prepared for death than anyone else. Our Lord conquered death on the cross in his resurrection. Scripture says he set us free from death in Hebrews. He says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We'll be with him. Scripture says that for the believer, death has no sting. And can even be considered gain, as Paul says. How do we respond well to death as we're affected by it, both whether directly or indirectly in the future? Now, I know this is a morbid text to kind of be looking through or to d- develop or look at. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all, so talks about how Scripture is meant to equip the man of God for all righteousness, and that includes facing death. Going through the Scriptures will deal with all the topics that have to do with righteousness that includes how we face death. And so we're going to look at several principles about this. First one, to face death properly, we must trust God's promises and help others do the same. We must trust God's promises and help others do the same. In Genesis 49, 29, Jacob said this, I'm about to go to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the, cave in the field of Ephraim, the Hittite. Now, Two things to notice, going to his people and being buried were two separate things. Jacob believed that when he died, he would be reunited with his family, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christ even talks about this later on when the Sadducees, who didn't believe in a resurrection, said, gave him a scenario trying to say that there was no resurrection. He says, have you not read that God is the father of Jacob and Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He's the God of the, the living, not the dead. Jacob had a faith in the resurrection, or had a faith, rather, in heaven. Um, in verse 33, it says, He breathed his last and, and went to his people, even though he was not yet buried. He went to his people. Hebrews 11, 9 through 10 in verse 16, talks about the faith of the patriarchs. By faith, talking about Abraham, he lived as a foreigner in the promised land as though it were a foreign country, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with firm foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Verse 16 says, 
But as it is, they aspire to a better land that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. When Jacob is in facing, facing death, what he does is he speaks in faith to his children. I've got to go to my people now. And so as he did this, what he was doing was inspiring them to believe that this is not ultimately our home. That we have another place and this life does not end right here. He spoke in faith and encouraged his children in faith. But not only that, when he tells them to bury his bones in Canaan, he spoke about God's purpose, his plan for them in the future. Obviously, at this point, Israel had moved to live in the land of Egypt because of the famine. And he's telling them, don't forget, one day we're going back there. And that's where God is. That's going to be our land. You're just not only you temporary residents on this earth, meaning that you're living for a heavenly home, but you're also temporary residents here in Egypt. And so when he's facing death, he speaks in faith and he encourages the faith of his sons. But we don't just see that with Jacob. We see that also with Joseph at the end of his life. Joseph has them promise in Genesis 50, 25, he says, don't bury my bones here. He lives to 110 years old. He says, don't bury my bones here. He says, when you go to the promised land, back to Canaan, take my bones there. He was put in a coffin. Most commentators seem to believe that this coffin was never buried. It was a perpetual witness. We're going back. We know, because we know the narrative, that Israel was in Egypt for 400 years. And for 400 years, this coffin of Joseph was a reminder. This isn't our home. God has plans for us in the promised land. Don't settle down into Egypt. You are not an Egyptian. You don't worship the idols of Egypt. Our land is over in Canaan, just over the desert. And so his coffin was a perpetual reminder. In the same way, one of the ways that we must face death death is by Believing in the promise of God that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That those who die in Christ shall be resurrected. So when Christ comes, he'll be resurrected. And we speak to those things. Ultimately, us, as we face death, we must speak of the promise of eternal life. We must share the gospel with others. We live in a land where everybody is dying. So-and-so lived, and then they died. So-and-so lived, and then they died. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jacob spoke of the afterlife, and we must do so as well. We do that by sharing the gospel with our friends, our family, sharing it in our business, because we live in a world where people are dying, and we must also speak in faith just like Jacob did. We do this also specifically, Christians, as we face the reality of death. When, we have our, when there are funerals, our funerals should be gospel-centered. Because just, again, as they're being buried, they're speaking in death. And the same way, when Christians have funerals and they share the gospel at these funerals, the unbeliever, unbelieving family members, the unbelieving friends get to hear the same thing that Jacob's family got to hear. There was more. That this isn't it. And we should not live as though it's it. And so in the same way, one of the things we must do is, is speak in faith and help others. Um, Believe in the promises of God. Just as Joseph's bones were a perpetual reminder, we also remind others as well as we face the reality of death. Here's the second thing we see here. To face death properly, we must mourn the deceased. We must mourn the deceased. In, verse, uh, in chapter 50, verse 1 through 3, we see that Jacob, immediately when his father dies, he weeps. This is, excuse me, Joseph weeps when Jacob dies. This is the seventh time in Scripture we see Joseph weeping, his final time. He weeps over his father. He kisses him. He has him embalmed for 40 days. They, they, the Egyptians mourn for 70 days. Probably the 40 is part of the 70. Then after he gets a chance to go to Canaan, he gets there and he mourns for another seven days. And so he mourns all together 77 days. The travel would have been about three weeks. And so all together, I guess you could say three months of mourning for Jacob. Now, Joseph, or with Jacob, Jacob believed he would die 17 years earlier. If you remember, when Jacob travels from Canaan and he goes to see his son Joseph, he says, now that I've seen you, now I can die. Joseph, J- Jacob believed he would have died 17 years earlier. And so for this family, Joseph and the other brothers... There would have been a great amount of time for them to prepare for his death. At this point, before he dies, he was bedridden, probably couldn't get out of bed. He could barely see. So they had all this time to prepare for his death. 
Um, and so it probably would have made the mourning period shorter for them because they had this time of preparation. However, for many deaths, they're on, for many deaths there's not that time, that time of preparation. When a child is taken away quickly, when a friend dies unexpectedly or a family member, many times mourning lasts for a great amount of time longer because there wasn't this period of time in preparation where we see it coming. Um, so they would have had a, they would have, they, this, this mourning probably was shortened for these brothers. However, as we consider mourning, we must recognize it's important for us as well. It's the way that we heal. When Jesus, when Lazarus dies, Jesus wept, even though he was about to raise him from the dead. He wept because he saw the consequences of sin that had gone on for thousands of years at this point, that death, um, men men died, he died, he wept no doubt about that. He wept because the relatives were mourning, he mourned. And in the same way that Christ mourned, it's biblical and healthy for us to mourn when there's death. Ecclesiastes 7.4 says this, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. The heart of fools is in the house of merrymaking. Now, when you're looking at wisdom in the Old Testament, it's not about intellectual, uh, intellectual ability. It's not that people who are very intelligent like to go to funerals, right? Wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Proverbs says, Wisdom in Scripture has to do with knowing God and loving God. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning because wise people who know God and love Him and love His Word realize that death is coming and that we must prepare for death. There's something about being in the house of mourning. But for the fool, they're in the heart of merrymaking. They don't want to think about death. They don't want to consider the reality that their time is limited on this earth. they rather drink it away. they rather party it away. But for the wise, it's in the house of mourning of mourning. And so it's proper for us to mourn. It's proper for us to weep, to to weep. And when we don't go through these stages, go through stages of mourning, what happens is we end up mourning in unhealthy ways. It eventually show up in unhealthy ways. Um, For instance, sometimes addictions are developed. Because people, instead of coping by mourning, they cope by going to a bottle. They cope by other things. And so what happens is many times people develop addictions because they don't mourn correctly. Um, Sometimes they develop anxieties, long-term depression because they're not mourning in a proper way. And therefore it shows up in other areas. If we don't mourn like Joseph mourns and the Egyptians mourns and Jesus mourns, what ultimately happens is it affects us and others in a negative manner. If Jesus mourned, then so should we. What are the normal stages of grief? What are the normal stages of grief? First of all, people typically go through denial. I can't believe this happened. He was just here yesterday. Many times they go through a period of isolation where they want to be by themselves. Sometimes it shows up in anger where they begin to get upset after denial. Then bargaining. When we've lost control, we naturally want to regain it. We may say, if I did this or if I did that, it's trying to control. There's this bargaining, sometimes bargaining with God. Then there's a depression, and then there is typically the last stage, which is acceptance of the loss. It's the new normal. Walking by the bus stop where we used to see the friend, and we, see, and he, we used to get on the bus together, but he's not there. Getting to the new normal, now I'm on the bus by myself. Or walking by the room where the person used to live, and now they're not there anymore, and now we're, we're accepting the new normal. This is, a, this is a, the last stage, and many times the longest stage, that people go through when they're going through this morning. Accepting the new normal. This is a healthy Uh, stages of grieving that we go through. However, with that said, as believers, we may go through these same stages of life when people die, but Scripture says it's not the same. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, Brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, those who have died, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. The difference is we may go through these same stages, developing a new normal, But for the believer, there should be hope. Because just like with Jacob going to be with his family, we have the hope of the resurrection. We have a hope that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And even when we go through unfortunate times when someone that we knew wasn't a believer or might not have been a believer, our hope is ultimately in the character of God who is all good, he's all wise, and he's sovereign. We trust that his plans are good even though we may not understand the fact that a relative or someone we knew that may not have known Christ, died. And so the hope of the mourning of a believer, we must mourn because it's healthy, but it should be different. Because as believers, we mourn in hope because we have a God who is the sovereign, who's the all-wise and the all-good, 
And even though we may not understand why he took some away or allowed them to die, we know his plans are ultimately always good. And so just like Joseph, as he mourns and he weeps over his father, and the Egyptians mourn and they weep for this 70 days, we also must mourn as well. Here's the third principle. To face death properly, we must take care of practical matters related to death. We must take care of practical matters related to death. After Jacob died, Joseph immediately had him embalmed for 40 days, which was a, uh, the way the Egyptians would typically handle people who died. It had to do with salting the body so it would be preserved, maybe specifically because they were going to have to travel for three weeks to get to Canaan, so he has them, in, has them embalmed. He gets permission from the Pharaoh so that they can go to Canaan. And then he buries, after getting there and weeping for seven days, he buries his father. He takes care of the practical matters related to death. In the same way, when someone dies today, there is a host of things that need to be completed. Funerals, taking care of the deceased estate, bills and wills. Sometimes when people have to encounter, to deal with these practical matters related to death, some people bottle up. They can't do it. They're not ready to deal with those things yet. Some people have speculated, maybe a holy speculation, that maybe many times God allows us to handle these practical matters related to death because many times it keeps people from being overwhelmed with death, overwhelmed with grieving. The fact that they have to take care of the funeral, the fact that they have to take care of the bills, many times it keeps them from being overwhelmed with the grieving process. And so there's practical matters that need to be taken care of. We... In Isaiah 31.8.1, when, when Hezekiah was about to die, where, where God told Hezekiah that he was going to die, he told them, put your house in order. Put your house in order. Meaning that for him to obey God in this time, he needed to get ready for death. In the same way, as we know that there is death, that death is coming ultimately, we must also be ready and prepared to take care of practical matters. Sometimes even preparing for them ourselves. One that might include Putting our house in order might include establishing a will and insurance. It means making it easier for our relatives to take care of practical matters. It may include downsizing it. In life, people tend to pick up a lot of stuff. And so when people die, there's oftentimes a lot of getting rid of the things that they have picked up. For me, as a chaplain in the military, always with the reality of the fact that I could get sent to war, etc., I have to. It's part of my job. I have to keep an updated will. Because ultimately, I could leave my family earlier than ultimately I'd like to. And so we have to as military members to keep those things in mind. And obviously, I have to deal with those things when there's a suicide or a death. Jacob and Joseph make plans for their death right before the, for their burial. Um, the inheritance, Jacob gives the inheritance. He calls Joseph to be a firstborn. He gives him a mountain. We see later on that Joseph, Jacob gives Joseph a mountain. Joseph seemingly adopts um, some of his some of his grandchildren and gives them an inheritance. We see in 50, chapter 50, verse 23 through 24. In the same way, we must take care of practical matters related to death as well and thinking about those beforehand. Here's the next one. To face death properly, we must support and encourage the living. We must support and encourage the living. After Joseph gets permission from Pharaoh to go and bury his father in Canaan, um, Pharaoh, there's a great procession that goes from Egypt to Canaan. Pharaoh's officials, at least three different Pharaoh's officials, Joseph's family, Egyptian military. So there's this large procession going across the desert, going to Canaan there. Think about this. Many of these Egyptians probably didn't even know Jacob. They didn't know Jacob, but guess what? They knew Joseph. And so because they knew Joseph, they went with him to support him and his family during this time of grieving. Similarly, one of the things that we should do when facing the reality of death is support those who are grieving. Support those who have lost a loved one. Romans 12, 15, um, Paul says this, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That there is a place for godly people. If we're the body of Christ and if one person's hurt, then there's a place for us mourning with them through this process. We're commanded to mourn, to weep, with those who weep. In the same way the Egyptians support and assisted Joseph, we must support and assist those who are going through the grieving process as well. We may not know what to say when someone dies. And let me tell you this, a little secret, not that I have lots of experience with this. Sometimes it's best not to say much at all. 
Many times it's best just simply to be with those who are in the grieving process and be beside them and listen. When Job, if you, if you remember the story of Job, he didn't just le- lose um, his crops and all those. He lost his children who had died, right? He lost his servants who had died as well. And then, so there, there was, this was not just a grieving of a loss of things and sickness. It was a grieving over family members and friends. And when his, his friends come beside him, in the very beginning, they do very well because they sit there and they say nothing. And they're beside him and they listen to his grief. It was when they opened their mouth that they sinned. <laughs> Sometimes the main thing we need to do, oftentimes when someone is going through a grieving process, they've lost someone, many times it's helpful for them to process their thoughts, their questions, sometimes about God, sometimes about why it happened. Sometimes it's just simply remembering the family member. And many times we support them simply by listening during that time and being beside them, even though it's awkward because you don't want to mess things up. You don't want to be around them because you may make them feel awkward. Many times it's comfortable or simply just be, be there with them. Now, there's a time for isolation. But many times we, com- we comfort them simply by being with them. And that's what the Egyptians were. They were present and they mourned with them. But also we support them in other practical ways. Remember, not only did Pharaoh give permission to go, but he sent an army with them, probably also to protect them during this journey as they went to the... To, he, so he did practical things. In the same way, we should consider things like providing meals. Who wants to cook sometimes when you're going, when you've just lost someone, providing meals, helping them with the details of the funeral. Sometimes the admin, we can help up in those things. Financial support, um, but also most importantly through prayer. That's what the Egyptians did. That's what Pharaoh did. He supported them practically. They went beside him and mourned with him. Let me add this in here. Um, 72 days was the normal, the normal amount of re- uh, mourning that was required for Pharaoh. They mourned 70 days. They honored Jacob. The Egyptians honored Jacob almost to the same extent that they would honor a Pharaoh that had died. And so they mourn and weep with Joseph in this, in this, uh, in this process. We must support and encourage the living. Here's the next one. To face death properly, we must seek to maintain or restore unity with family members. We must seek to maintain or restore unity with family members. After the death, what we see, after the burial, the Joseph brothers realize that Joseph may now want to get vengeance on them. If you remember the story, Joseph's brothers sell him, the 11 of the brothers sell Joseph into slavery, um, where he becomes, he's a slave and then becomes a prisoner and God exalts him to second in command. And so they say, now that the father's dead, maybe Joseph will now get vengeance on us. They have been in Egypt for 17 years. Joseph's been providing for them. But now when the death happens, they're worried that, they, that he may come to get judgment. And so they, they send ahead someone, probably it was probably Judah or Benjamin, to go and talk with Joseph and, and tell him that it was the father's last wish, the father's last wish that you would reconcile and forgive them. And then they come and they throw themselves before him and say, we're your slaves. Now, quick question, did Jacob really request that Joseph forgive them? Was that some, or were they lying? Um, it's impossible to really tell, but most likely, remember, Joseph was the first one that was with Jacob when he was dying, and, Joseph, and Jacob adopts Joseph's sons. Most likely, Jacob would have told Joseph personally. But either way, we can be sure, as a father, he wanted reconciliation with his kids, just like any good father would, so we can have no doubt about that. But let me add this in here. Many times you might think that when there's a death in a family, that many times it brings families closer, many times it's actually the opposite. Families are messy, just like we see in the story of Jacob. Um, Often there's discord between husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, children and parents. And what happens when there's a death of a loved one, what it does is it causes everyone to come together. Kind of like sometimes Christmas and holidays, sometimes in people's homes are explosive, right? You get all these families. And not only are they together, but now they have to work together to take care of the, the, the practical matters related to death. So, so many times, death becomes a time where there's a lot of discord, especially when people haven't taken care of the practical matters related to death. Just like God told Hezekiah, prepare, get your household in order. Many times people haven't done that, even Christians, because they, maybe they think they're going to live forever or something, I don't know, right? And they've never done that. And what can happen is it becomes a matter of infighting between children and relatives. It happens all the time. Um, 
If the deceased didn't have clear wills, including instructions, burial, estate, many times it exasperates old wounds. How should families seek to maintain or restore unity with family members when a relative or a relative's death occurs? There's a couple of principles. First one, to pursue family unity, we must be willing to confess past failures and offer restitution. That's exactly what these, the brothers do. They come before him and they say, forgive us for what we have done. And they throw themselves and say, we're your slaves. What were they doing? They sold them into slavery. And so they say, we're your slaves now. In the same way, many times asking for forgiveness isn't enough to reconcile a relationship. If you stole something, then simply saying, I'm sorry, may not be enough. You need to give back what you stole as well as say, I'm sorry. And so what they do is they say, I'm sorry, and they offer restitution. Second thing, to pursue family unity, often we must be willing to be intermediaries. If Jacob did in fact say, Joseph, please forgive your brothers, then what he was doing is he was operating as an intermediary between the two warring, potentially warring faculties, even though we have nothing that says Joseph had any anger towards them. He had forgiven them. He had provided for them. But if Jacob did, in fact, say this, he was being an intermediary. It's the same thing Christ did with us. We were at enmity. God never did anything wrong. We have turned away from him. We're at enmity because of our sins. And what Christ dies, does is he comes and pays the penalty and says, accept the reconciliation. Be restored to God. And so what we should do as Christians in dealing with these matters, and this is, doesn't, this just, doesn't just have to do with uh, death and the, in, the infighting that often comes from that. It also has to do with infighting in your clubs. It has to do with infighting with your relatives. It has to do with infighting when you're at a workplace. That many times we have to do exactly what Christ did. We're Christians. We come and we help the other sides come together. And that's what Jacob does here. Here's the third thing. To pursue family unity, we must overcome evil with good. We must overcome evil with good. Joseph says, as for you, but you, you meant to harm me, in Genesis 50, 20. You meant to harm me, but God intended it for a good purpose. So he could preserve the lives of many people, as you can see. Oh, sorry, I skipped over something. We must overcome evil with goods. Romans 12, 19 through 21 says this. Do not avenge yourselves, dear friends, but give place to God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Rather... If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing this, you'll be heaping burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Joseph responds to them, am I in the place of God? Am I, am I the one to judge you, essentially, for you sending me into slavery? So what Joseph does is he says, I'm going to allow vengeance to be God. I'm, instead of seeking justice, I'm going to allow God to handle justice. And what he says is, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of your family. I'm going to meet your needs. God's going to take care of it. I'm not in the place of God. Now, many times there is a place for us to seek justice in this sense of going to authorities. Romans 13, 1 through 7 says God has given authorities for that purpose, to reward the righteous and punish the wrongdoer. There's a place for that. But one of the Christian ethics we see taught throughout Scripture is that we should turn the other cheek when someone slaps us, meaning we could go get our, we could even go to the police for something like that, but we choose not to. First Peter says, love, uh, says, uh, love covers a multitude of wrongs. So many times what we do is simply say, God, I'm going to allow you to handle this. God, I'm going to serve them. I'm going to bless them. In the same way, we must do the same, where we allow God to handle justice and we simply bless those around us. That was one of the ways that Joseph was going to was seeking reconciliation with his brothers. He's going to leave that to God and bless those around them. Here's a fourth way. To pursue family unity, we must focus on God's sovereignty over evil and not the evil actions of others. We must focus on God's sovereignty over evil and not the evil actions of others. He simply says, what you meant for harm or for bad, God meant for good. So what could be happening today that we had saved many different lives. Many times people struggle with forgiving, the, forgiving those who criticize them especially if you serve in leadership. If you step up and lead your team or you're serving in leadership of a club, those who won't will typically criticize you. That's what happens when you're in leadership. Welcome to the party, right? Christ was criticized by the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Welcome to the party. 
Many times, one of the ways that you get over, whether it's criticism or people that hurt you, is simply think about the fact that God is working everything to the good of those who love the Lord. Meaning that even what you're experiencing now in your family, there's discord in your family or difficulty at your workplace, somehow God is using it for the good. So what Joseph does, now he can obviously see, see the end of it. God has exalted him to, uh, to second in command in Egypt. He's being used to save people during a famine. He can look back at the end of it. But you know it's happening even if you can't see how God's going to use it. And so many times what you have to do when you're going through a trial or experiencing some, um, some, uh, experiencing some hardship where people are hurting you is think about somehow God is going to use this for the good and I'm going to praise him for it now. I'm going to praise him for it now. Um, whether that means he's going to draw you to the word of God more, he's going to draw you to prayer more. Um, you have to focus on that reality even though you may not see it acted out yet in the future. That's what Joseph does. He focuses on what God, how God was going to use that for the good, and it kept him, enabled him to forgive, enabled him to love and serve them. Listen, if you just simply focus on evil people or good people that say things, uh, say bad things um, with good intentions, you know, if, they, if you simply focus on that, you're going to be a person that's going to be, it's going to be hard for you to forgive. You're going to find you have a lot of bitterness. You'll find that you'll stay up at night replaying the situation over and over and again in your mind. I have to work through that myself. I have to think about how God is using this for the good and bless and pray and, and, and love on those um, that may do things that may be harmful to me whatsoever. Um, and so in the same way, you must develop the ability to do that as well. And we're all trying to work through this because when you go through a hard time, you just tend to focus on the hard time or the difficult people. But it's divine for us to focus on God's hand in the midst of all that and what he's doing. Even if you have to do holy imagination. Maybe this. Um, as you, many of you know, I had to go on sabbatical or leave of, abs- la- leave of absence last semester. Um, last semester, I started to struggle with, and I still, it still comes on, I, will, I struggle with loud noise. When I get overstressed and I only get like half a Saturday on the weekend, um, because most pastors will have like Monday off. Or something like that. Here at Handong, that's not true necessarily for pastors. You work Monday through Friday. You preach on Sunday. And so you may sometimes, you may, it's hard to have a, a Sabbath day. And so what happens to me when I have those, those times where I don't get good rest, I start struggling with loud noise. Ever since the earthquake and the aftershocks, if I hear something loud, I jump or I start to, my body reacts. This happens especially when I get overstressed. Um, I start to have very strong emotions um, when and these things start to pop up again. And when I'm on leave of absence, pe- people think, oh, sabbatical is great, and et cetera. But for me, it was really hard. It was really difficult uh, during the season. I'm over here wrestling with these things, and I'm like, am I done with ministry? Can I go back into it? Can I handle it anymore? Right? I'm wrestling through it. And at the same time, I'm holding on to the fact, but maybe, God, maybe you're going to use this for my good. Maybe... There's going to be more grace when I study the Bible. There's going to be more grace when I preach. And that's kind of what I had to hold on to as I'm wrestling through these weaknesses. And I, and I will say that for myself, I have experienced more grace even though I'm still wounded in some ways. I still things still pop up. And this is hard for a guy that's trained as an athlete gone through the military, and they be, you're trained to be tough. You're supposed to be hard. And so for me to have these emotional weaknesses, very difficult for me to go through and experience. But the hope was for me as I'm wrestling with, hey, this may be my last semester of ministry. I may not be able to do it after a year. Is God, those who bear fruit, you prune so you can bear more fruit to them. That's what I'm going to hold on to, even though I can't feel it in a season. Because for me, sabbatical was, Lord, you took away ministry. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't keep going. It wasn't a blessing as someone, oh, I get to go rest. It was, I can't do it. And so for me, that was kind of what I had to hold on to. Somehow, Father, I'm going to trust it even though I don't feel it. And I'm not sure. Maybe you're going to call me to go into some other vocation. Maybe this is something you're going to use for my good. And so in the same way, we must experience, whether it's the criticism or the, the conflict or whatever we go through, we must focus on the promises of God that he's using it for good. And that enables us to go through it. And specifically in this context, it helps us work for unity. It helps us work for unity when we realize that. Here's the last one. To face death properly 
We must eventually, in faith, move on. We must eventually, in faith, move on. Genesis 50, 14 says this. After he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt along with his brothers, all who had accompanied him to bury his father. Now, this has been a long process. Again, 70 days of mourning, three weeks of traveling, seven days of mourning again, so over around three and a half months, and then he goes back with his brothers, and he moves on. Jacob, when Jacob died, Joseph was 56 years old. The scripture tells us here, he lived to 110. God had many more things for Joseph to do, including his highlight years or twilight years. Ephraim's kids, he sees Ephraim's kids to the third generation, meaning he was probably a great, great, a great, great grandfather. He seemingly adopts Makur's children, the son of Manasseh. And 50:23, it says he gave him some type of special inheritance. Literally, Hebrew is they were born on his knees. Same thing that happened in Genesis 49 with Jacob when he takes the, 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 the 20-year-old kids and says something about them being on his knees. It seems to be a formal adoption process. So Joseph gives um, the sons of Manasseh an inheritance, a formal adoption. Similarly, we must continue to live after the death of a loved one. God still has plans. He's not done with us. We will never forget. Our lives will always be richer because of them. And they will always remain in our memories. However, according to Ecclesiastes 3, 4, it says this. There is a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A a time to dance. There's a time to focus on life's pains. And then there's a time to focus on life's joys. A time to focus on the good things and not just the hard things of life. For many, it's it's, it's difficult to move on after the death of a loved one. For, it's important to remember, especially if they are believers, that they are more alive than they have ever been as they're with Christ in heaven. And if they didn't know Christ again, we must still focus on God's good plans, right? That, that God is good. He has, his plans are perfect. We must take comfort in his perfect character. We must remember that God is good both in the green pastures of Psalm 23 and also through the darkest valleys. He's still our shepherd. He's still with us, and he'll carry us then in the good times, and he'll also be with us through the difficulties. We must realize that he's carrying us through. And so like Job, Job 121, after he loses his kids and loses his, his servants, he says, the Lord gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, yes, there's a time for mourning, but there's also a time where we must be able to get back up. God still has other things he wants to do through us. As we consider Jacob and Joseph and how they face death, we learn something about how we should face death. I want to invite EPT up here. To face death properly, we must trust God's promises and help others do the same. That's exactly what Jacob and Joseph are doing. They're believing in God, and they help others believe in God, even as they're going into the grave, believing in, believing in the fact that you go to heaven, believing in the fact that our call is to be in the, the, the land over there. We must mourn the deceased individually. We must take care of practical matters related to death. We must support and encourage the living as we see that all these Egyptians went with Joseph to mourn. Let me add this about funerals. Funerals are about the deceased, but they are not for the deceased. Funerals are for the living. Therefore, the living to give them closure so they can remember their lives. And that's one of the reasons it's important for us to be there with them, to go through that process with them. And so in the same way, we must support and encourage living through our prayers, through financial support, through practical means as Pharaoh does. To face death properly, we must seek to maintain or restore unity with family members. Let me tell you, just as holidays sometimes are difficult and explosive when families come together, many times funerals are explosive, especially when it comes to handling the practical matters after and so what, often ha- what we often need to do is work, realize that that's commonly a reality, even amongst good Christians. Um, and we must seek to maintain family unity. And that's exactly what the brothers do, whether they're telling the truth or not about Jacob saying this. And that's what Joseph does. They work for family unity in the midst of confronting this death. And finally, to face death properly, we must eventually in faith move on. Um, as we look at this reality, one of the things that's, I think that's been happening in our community. There's been a lot of deaths. 
We obviously, we had a suicide not too long ago. Uh, we've had members in our community that have had relatives die. Um, and I'm sure that many of you that have things that I'm not aware of. We're going to take some time just to pray in response. If we could pray that for those who have experienced it recently, and maybe even years ago that are still struggling, if we could pray that God would give them comfort, that he would comfort them, pray that he would heal them, and pray that God would use even that as he's promised for their good. We could pray for those who have experienced loss. And second thing, let's pray for grace to love them and even mourn with them um, and support them. Pray for God to give us grace to be able to do that. So let's lift up those things for our community and for our campus. with those who mourn and to rejoice with those who rejoice means that we have to be like a body. It's normal for us sometimes when people experience good things to be jealous. Why didn't I get that? Um, And it's hard for us to sometimes step into someone's sorrow. But that happens the more that we become one flesh, the more that we become a body. And so if you could pray for our church, that we would love one another, that we would experience the good times with one another, rejoicing with them and praising and celebrating other people's successes, but also that we could weep with them, that we could um, experience their sorrows and also bless them in the midst of it. If you could pray for God to make us more of a body, more of a church that loves one another, and more of a church that experiences the highs and lows together, if we could pray that for one another as a church, and also we could pray that for our campus. praise God in faith right now. Thank you that for the Christian, death has lost its sting. Thank him that he's delivered us from the fear of death. Thank him that to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Thank him for all the promises that are true for the believer. And we will live with him and we'll rule with him. Thank Father, thank God for his grace and what he's done for us as believers. Let's praise him for that. that as we face death or hard times like Jacob and Joseph, pray that we would share our faith with others as well. That our hard times, sometimes people's hard times actually can pull people away from God because they complain, they become bitter. But pray like Jacob and Joseph, we were responding faith. We speak of God's promises. We speak of God's gospel in a world that's dying. That we speak of the grace that's given to those um, who are weak. And so right now, begin to pray that God would give us grace to speak for him and to experience our dark times in faith as Jacob and Joseph do and to speak God's promise. Pray for us to be evangelistic church. Pray for us to be a church that shares the word of God with others. Pray for us to have boldness. Let's pray for that for our church and for our campus as well.
put your hand on the shoulder of someone next to you and just spend some time thanking God for their lives. Thanking God for the promises that he spoke over them. Thank him for the ways that he wants to use them. And pray that God would complete his work. That God would be exalted in their life. Paul prays this. He says, I know that um, I'm confident that God would be exalted in my life, whether through life or death. Pray that God would be glorified and magnified through their life, through their finals, through their summer, through their relationships. And one day when God takes them on, pray that God would be exalted and magnified, that people would see Christ because of them. Pray for protection over them and blessing, and that God would use them in a mighty way. Pray for those around us. Let's go ahead and stand and sing and finish our service worshiping God together. symbolically to the Lord in the sense of receiving. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're our shepherd. We thank you, Lord, that you lead us beside still waters. We're often afraid of many things, and sometimes even running water may scare us as sheep, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you're always leading us in the right paths for your glory, not for our name, but for your glory's sake. We thank you, Lord, that even when we go through the valleys, the dark times, Lord, you're with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. We thank you, Lord, even in the presence of our enemies, you prepare a table for, before us so that we can eat without worry, that we can eat without concern. Father, when we're injured, Lord, you anoint our heads. You give us water. Our cup overflows. We thank you, Lord, that your goodness and your mercy run after us all the days of our lives. We're going to dwell in your presence forever. We thank you for your goodness, Father. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, in the midst of this journey, our individual journeys and our corporate journey, you've made us a family. That we have brothers and sisters who walk through the valleys with us and who walk on the green pastures. And so we rejoice in them and we thank you for them. And we do pray for a great amount of comfort for those who are in the valleys right now. We thank you that we can walk beside them even as you are. Lord, you're good and we honor you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father.
Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.